Here's another dad that's quite a dad. His name is Dan Loney. Dan has a company up in BC. It's one of the six top financial management companies in uh, the province. And uh, in 2018, Loney Financial was uh, inducted into the Wealth Professional Hall of Fame, only one of 11 such firms. And currently, I can't believe this, this guy is running seven separate enterprises at the same time, and he's working us in today. Would you please uh, welcome with a thumbs up my friend Dan Loney from uh, British Columbia. Dan, are you there? I'm here, George. Thank you. I want to know what you thought of our little Canadian Open today. <laughs> well, I, I felt so honored. And, you know, I just was waiting for the hockey puck to drop. That's what got <laughs> me going. <laughs> Dan, uh, you and I have known each other for a dozen years or so. And yep. I just, uh, I love the way you light up a room. And I love the way you keep so many plates spinning at the same time. And you're doing such meaningful stuff with your life. When did you first realize that God was preparing you uh, to do something so remarkable with your, with your years? Well, I think, George, there, there was a time of life, busy time of life, where you know, we had five small young kids. And the, the goal was just to keep the cornflakes on the breakfast table tomorrow morning, right? Yeah along um i think one of the the defining moments was when um i went through arrow and i think you're familiar with arrow and uh leadership and when i was graduating from arrow in uh georgia in 2011 i remember we had had some changes in our business and i really wanted to drill down the, the deep dive deep dive on leadership. So that's why I went through their 18 month program. And some things had changed in my business and that, that I really felt, well, why did I do this God? Because uh, it didn't feel like uh, I was now in a place where I'd signed up for all of this. And I, it was our convocation evening. I was by myself. Most of the, uh, the graduates had their spouses there and they're from all around the world. And I went and sat in a boardroom and I said, you know, Lord, what's going on? And my phone rang at that very moment. And it was um, uh, a fellow in Canada, Bob Cheatley, who was the chairman of the board of Focus on the Family Canada. And he said, Dan, he said, we just came out of executive committee meeting. And he said, we've selected you to be the next chairman of the board of Focus in Canada. Would you, would you consider that? And that's, I think that's when it hit me that, God was saying, okay, kid, uh, suit up. I want you on the court now. Uh, and I got the tap. And uh, I think that's when the leadership issue really started to become front and center with me. What was it like, Dan, uh, growing up for the young Dan Looney? Were you from a huge family like you have now? <clears throat> no, I was uh, mom and dad and a little sister, four years younger than me. Um, I think boredom was the uh, the worst enemy in my life. I was a busy little guy, drove everybody nuts, lots of energy, and uh, grew up in a northern town up in British Columbia. And during the 60s, my father started with one man and one truck and built one of the top five electrical companies in Western Canada by, the by 1971. Then at 14 years old, he... Um, Mom, I came home from school one day. Mom sat me down and said, Danny, I got some bad news for you. I said, what's going on, Mom? She said, well, your father's plane is missing. My father had corporate aircraft that he flew around in and um, turned out that they had crashed and everybody on board was killed. So my life really changed at that point at age 14. What did you get from your dad, Dan, up until age 14? And what did you miss by not having him? My father was my hero. He uh, was a, an amazing man. Um, you know, George, you said I light up a room if I walked in. Well, my dad would explode the room when he walked in. He, he just had an amazing command, compassion, presence. Uh, he built a multi-million dollar corporation with a grade eight education. And he, he, I know why today, because of my mentorship with Bob Beal over the last 20 years. And the time, I understand why my father was so successful. He was a master team builder. 
he would search out the best people in the world to build hydroelectric dams or towers or that type of thing. Um, but the one lesson he left with me, I will never forget. He gave me a pick one day and he had me in this driveway, uh, dig up this tar. It just seemed to be a useless, empty job. And it was a hot day and I was probably 10 years old. And he came along and said, dad, this is such hard work. And he said, son, I want you to remember something. Never, ever give up. And, and that became the model of my life. That became one of the most defining moments that my father spoke into my life, that no matter where you are in life, no matter what the chips are against you or whatever you feel, uh, there's that, that call to never, ever give up. Because the moment you give up, you limit God. But if you don't give up, you don't limit, you don't limit God. You have so many areas in your life, Dan, where you could, you could give up uh, easily. And uh, a lesser man would, would have done it a long, a long time ago. Do you have a cheerleader in your life? Do you have a, a small group of men who come alongside you and get a kick in the rear when you need it? I have from time to time um, to have that support is wonderful. I've just found that with um, my miles an hour and um, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't always work for me to, for, to be able to attend a group or something like that. But I, I do have a couple mentors in my life that uh, I meet with regularly. And of course, one is my relationship with Bob Beal, who's going to be your speaker. What a, I mean, I, I will try and be on that call. I, I've followed Bob halfway around the world to Europe, anywhere just to be in the presence of a man that has spoke so much into my life. Uh, and I have a, a spiritual mentor too, a, a man of God that, you know, he understands me. He, he built a $6 billion company in uh, 15 years and retired at age 50 because he just wanted to be in the ministry. That's all he wanted to do. And I just found that uh, spending lunch with him once a month on a regular basis has really spoken into my life. When I have a theological questions or things like that, I get together with my other friend, Bob, and uh, just have some fellowship. So, and I, I also have a sense of accountability to him as well. So, I know that you can talk about Bob Beale for hours and hours, but it's been a it's been a goal of mine to get the men of his deal introduced to his resources. And we have many of them on our site. Mm. What, what can you tell us about the advantages that you've picked up what, uh, down through the years? You don't have to get to specific tools, but what, uh, give us a macro view of what Bob has done to impact your life. Well, Bob has given me tools to address every situation that can communicate. Einstein said that uh, simplicity is the greatest genius. And Bob has an amazing ability to take complex situations and simplify them right down to a sentence. I'll give you one example. I got asked to speak at a, a breakfast meeting and uh, most of the people in that audience, I didn't even know. And I was asked to, our friend Carson Pugh asked me to speak years ago and I, he said, could you speak just for about 15, 20 minutes? So I got up and I spoke on a concept that Bob taught me called clarify, don't confront. And it was how often when we get into a confrontational situation, we choose sides on who we're gonna support and help the other side see that this, and, and what Bob taught me was don't do that. Sit down with both parties and drill down on the facts and 50% of the time, the whole issue, the whole controversy will go away. And so I talked about that in that simple process, that slogan, clarify, don't confront. I got back to my office, went through the day later on that afternoon, I got an email from somebody in the audience. That said, they said, Dan, you don't know me, but I sat in your talk this morning at the breakfast. And uh, I got back to the office this morning and there was a major fire going on in our company. I sat down both parties 
and said, would you please state your facts? And did not allow the other party to talk. And then I said, would you please state your facts? Did not allow the other party to talk. He said, just the facts being stated, the fire went away. And he says, amazing. So thank you very much. So simplistic things where Bob is giving me tools that are ready to hit the road and I could use them right away. So. This is a pandemic that we are all living under right now. It seems to be driven by confusion and hatred and fear, and, but it's got to be replete with opportunities. What, what opportunities do you see for us uh, as believers at a time such as this? Well, Peter Drucker said this year's good surprise is next year's opportunity. And some of the consulting work that we're doing in our consulting company is to say, in this pandemic, what has surprised you that has not turned out bad, but actually been good? And for example, in our financial company, this pandemic forced our industry in Canada to accept DocuSign, where I, we can meet with clients online complete all the needed paperwork that we need to do online and have them electronic signature. So it's a huge advancements into our industry and a real opportunity. Now, I think about your group here this, this afternoon. And George, I'm on here and if I scan through there, I've got like three screens of men here. I, do, I realize something, George, this, you, you can have a thousand men on here. This is a wonderful time of fellowship to hear a, a testimony like Bill's testimony. Bill, you made me think of uh, Bob Vernon. When I was 14 years old, I met Bob Vernon, the captain of the LA Police Department. To think about the wise words that he spoke that I still have that image of uh, Bob Vernon to this day. But um, what an opportunity uh, for your ministry here to reach out to men with the solution for life. And uh, so we're, something that we're actually doing is developing tools to go into companies and organizations that will have task teams to uh, uh, find the opportunity. Then how do we develop that opportunity going into 2021? You spoke about your counseling ministry, uh, Dan. What are, what are some of the primary issues that men are facing these days that you're working with them on? Well, we... Uh, it's a consulting company, and we, to answer that question for leaders, um, it comes back to generally fog, fatigue, and flirtations. That leaders, uh, when you have stress in your life, they're caused by um, major factors of indecision or lack of control. So right now we have COVID, which is a lack of control. We can't control. We've had to cancel events uh, that were sold out for us. Um, we've had to change things just because of our lack of control. So um, that can create stress. And then when the stress does its work in your life, it begins to create fatigue. You get worn out. And then once you get worn out, you start to make poor decisions. Now, George, you fully understand the basketball world having observed it professionally for so many years. Have you often wondered when we look at a, just an amazing basketball player in my world, the hockey world, make a bad pass and you think, what was that all about? And we know from physiology and training athletes that fatigue uh, creates an environment where we start to make bad decisions. And it's the same way in the executive world, the same way in the leadership world, that if we allow ourselves to become fatigued, we'll start to flirt with bad ideas and bad decisions. So that's what we see, is we see um, the confusion, the fog, we see fatigue, and then we see people flirting with bad ideas. Bob has got a new book out, uh, Decades by Decades. Yes. It's just uh, shed so much light on life and, and it, it, in a sense it, it helps you make sense uh, of every stage of life and predict almost what's gonna happen in that stage of life so that you're not taken totally by surprise. 
Talk to us about that book, and I'm sure you're probably teaching it right now. <clears throat> yes, actually, that book has created a lot of um, speaking opportunities for me. I didn't realize it, but um, I give that book out by the hundreds. It is an amazing book. And what it talks about is that every decade of our life has a major team. So the first 10 years is safety. Uh, and by the way, when Bob wrote the book, he sent me the manuscript, emailed at me, and I was on a flight to Guatemala. And I read the book. And when I got there, I was thinking, oh, Bob's missed it. He, it's not about safety. The, the most important thing in your life, first decade, is love. And I was standing at our orphanage with about 100 little kids looking at these little girls and little boys. And then I realized, I said, you know what? A lot of these little children were loved, but they weren't safe. And Bob's right. You've got to have children raised on a platform of safety. And a lot of kids grew up tough, tough ghettos. Tough. Their mom, mamas loved them, but they weren't safe. And um, so first decade is safety. Second de decade is self, you know, kids, selfies, all of that. Teenager, what am I all about? Trying to find themselves. Where do they fit in their social setting? Uh, the 20s, that decade is about... Um, survival because you've gone from the uh, the teenage world into the adult world and you're trying to survive in your 20s and by the way I've always said that 20s is not about figuring out what you want to do it's about figuring out what you don't want to do I get 20 year olds coming to be 28 27 they go oh I just can't figure out I said well you've done this done this done this you've just realized a whole bunch of things you don't want to do that's progress you're making progress by the time we hit our 30s we then um, it's about success. We figured out something we want to do. And now we're focusing on success. Our 40s, it's about um, uh, significance, being living a significant wife. But it's, it's significant slash stress because 40s are your most stressful years. You've got teenagers, most heart attacks, most divorces, most negative things that happen in families all happen in our 40s. By your 50s, you hit your stride. If you've done what you've been doing for 20 years, you could do it on autopilot in your sleep and you're really good at it. By the 60s, you want to become very strategic. I find, uh, I find the one of the most strategic words in my life now is the word no, because every time I say yes to something, I have to say no to something else. And, you know, running seven divisions in the Loney Group, um, having raised... Um, birth, adopted, and raised 36 children. We still have 12 children at home, uh, 14 in the house. It, it's a very, very busy life. And throw a couple hockey games in there, you know, every week in the winter and a little bit of golf in the summer. Um, I got to learn to, I'm now becoming strategic, uh, whereas before I would just tackle everything. Uh, 70s all focus on succession. 80s is a, a little bit slippery because of health, right, George? You can get some health challenges. There's no man has a lease on life. And then uh, 90s is sleep. So I look at life, 0 to 30 is the first period as a hockey player. Second period is 30 to 60. I'm in the third period of my life. Want to finish well. You win hockey games in the third period. You win football games in the fourth quarter. And then if God blesses me with overtime, we'll, we'll see what happens. So overtime is sudden death, as you know. Hey, boy, the uh, Canucks got a dandy goal last night in uh, the first minute. They did. And um, the linesman, number 79, is my client. And uh, I, I have the pleasure of texting him after the game. We had a little bit of dialogue. And he calls them mini. And he, <laughs> he says they're a very cantankerous group. Uh, very good hockey club, but um, yeah, he made a call in that game, which they weren't too happy about. Coville uh, fell on the puck, and he called it, uh, passing it with his hand out of the faceoff. So uh, Kyle's the guy that made that call, but it was a good game. It was fun to see them win. We'll see what happens. Thursday is going to be a little, little testy, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, we've got to have some questions from around the room. Uh, yeah. You guys like uh, McKeehill and Spear and Glover and Stein, Marcus, what questions do you have for Dan? George, can I make a comment while they're thinking about their question? You bet. You know, I speak and I, they always want a biography, right? And they go, well, he did this, he's in the Hall of Fame and, uh, and he's, 
he's uh, helped build this orphanage. He's has all these kids. He's done that. But one thing I want to really point out, you know, I, I, I'm a guy that uh, one of my sons has been in the psych ward twice. He's mm -hmm. a genius, has an IQ of 165. And I know what it's like to sit in a psychiatric uh, unit with a brilliant uh, computer software engineer that's um, blown a fuse. Mm -hmm. um, I had a son uh, on drugs uh, in, um, involved with gangs and the mafia. He uh, earned, he made $100,000 tax free a month. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a contract on his life. He actually came to me one day and he, he met me at a Starbucks and, uh, and uh, uncharacteristically he said, I want to have a coffee with you. And I said, well, what's going on? He said, dad, I just come to say goodbye because I have a contract on my life and, and they'll get me. There's no way I can get away from this. Um, I sat in a thoracic surgeon's uh, waiting room to find out about uh, cancer, um, going in for a, a cancer operation. I've, I've had all kinds of things in life. There's a lot that I've experienced on the good side and the bad side. And so, um, and then, you know, I got, once I was introduced to this group of uh, mayors and um, member of parliaments, and they asked me to speak before 300 uh, business executives and that, and they read my bio and I got up and I looked at the ball and I said, uh, actually my 85 year old mother wonders why you're all here today. And uh, because she said, who would ever want to listen to you? You know, so, um, just to, to say, yeah, there's that vile God has done amazing things, but had a lot of hardships. Um, uh, of him. He is faithful. He has answered our prayers. And in life, for every challenge that we have come across, I now look at that challenge as a rock in the river, a big rock. And uh, I was in a rapids once. I went whitewater rafting with my sons and got tossed out of the uh, the raft in a level five category uh, rapids and uh, know what it's like to go down the river without a raft and, and have these big rocks coming at you. But what I've learned is that if father does not remove the rock, by his grace, he raises the river. Mm. And he help, helps me through the tough times that I can get through. By, and that river is his grace. Um, so here we are in COVID. I have peace that passes understanding. Um, and uh, I fully, fully encourage one to just seek a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ because he is a wonderful Lord and Savior. And that's my testimony. And you're sticking to it. And I'm sticking to it. That's right. Good. How about, how about some questions, some feedback? Um, what do you think of what you heard? I see some on the chart on the chat, with George and and um, Dan. Um, Jim Spear wants to know if uh, retirement is a biblical idea. Well, that's a great question, and I don't believe it is. Um, we actually don't even use the word retirement in our uh, planning and our discussions. We use the word transition because. Um, where in the Bible do you find, okay, let's talk about Samson. When he retired, what happened? Well, he went down with all the Philistines. His ministry was over and his life was over. When Moses retired, got the children to the land of Cain, what happened? The Lord took him out. When Jesus had fulfilled his ministry, there was no retirement. He was taken. Um, and on and on and on. So, no, I don't believe that um, we retire. And I, I'm absolutely convinced uh, this morning when I studied the scriptures early this morning Paul I was reading the Corinthians he talks he says you know the manifest power of God is really most available in my weakness and I feel that as we get older the more important things come to light and the great the greatest thing that we can you know, we need to get something out of our vocabulary and, that, and it's the words, well, all we can do is pray. Yeah. We need to get that out of our vocabulary because I believe that prayer is the highest calling that any of us could have. And um, 
I used to fear that Jesus would take me inside and say, well, you know, well done, the good and faithful servant, but come here, I want to show you a video of what you could have done if you'd really, really trusted me. And I always felt some condemnation, but a good friend of mine by the name George on this call took me inside, showed me that scripture. Therefore, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. So when I meet Jesus, we're just going to hug, weep, and cry, and laugh, and uh, enjoy the moment. We're getting a bunch of questions here. <laughs> uh, uh, Marcus Norton wants to ask, Dan, at what point did you realize your faith and business not only could coexist, but could abundantly thrive together? At what point? Yeah, I think um, I think one of the turning points for me was reading the di biography of George Mueller. George Mueller um, built an orphanage in England that to over 10,000 children went through and in a time when there were no orphanages there was 6,000 children in the 1800s incarcerated in in British prisons so these are not youth detention juvenile homes uh Bill you'd be familiar with that but this is this is prison so you stole bread you went to prison and um Charles Dickens who wrote Oliver Twist actually visited Mueller and wrote about the plight of these children and Oliver Twist but uh, I think it was reading his biography and his watching his dependence and faith on God. He never asked for a penny. God supplied all his need. And I thought, well, if God could do that for Mueller, why couldn't he do that in, in my business? We got two, two great questions from Ed McCahill. I love this one. Uh, Dan, if you could get a mulligan in life, what would you do over? Wow, that is a great question. I'm, thank you for that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal that one. Yeah, um, I think um, let me just think about that for a second. I think if if what comes to mind, I never had a formal education because I never respected it. My father built a corporation with a grade eight education, and I thought, well, I can do the same. Um, and I'm autodidact, so I'm self-taught, self-learned. Everything I've learned, I've either signed up for the course or, or put myself through. But I had a university education paid for. I never went because I started my first business when I was right up, pretty much out of high school selling fitness equipment. There was not, no such store in Canada. And I'd seen one in Vine Nuys, California. I thought, what a great idea. Went home, started with a friend. And uh, built that business up to 86, and we sold that 1986 or 87. So I, one desire would be I'd, I'd love to get a, a formal education, like I'd love to get an MBA or uh, get a degree in leadership or something like that. That's one mulligan I would play. And if, if I had another one, it would be when I started my financial business, I was so terrified of failure. I worked 15 hours a day. I'd change that. I'd work smarter knowing what I know today and I'd sp spend more time with my kids. Uh, my kids grew up, or my original five are doing great, all of them. But I, you know, I, I they'll we'll sit around and the kids will t say the story, they're all adults now, but they say, hey mom, you remember this and that? And they'll go, and I'll go, I don't remember that. What? When was that? And she apologetically or kind of looks at me and she says, sweetie, it's okay you were at work, you know, so I would change that. Okay, and the final question from Ed is, uh, with so many accomplishments, Dan, what do you think your legacy will be? Wow, I, I hope that my legacy will be some form of inspiration, that I would live a life that would inspire others to serve Christ and walk in Christ's footsteps and apply that what, whatever calling in life they have, whether it's ministry, whether it's business, whether it's service, no matter what they're doing, whether they're a pilot, you know, whatever they're doing, I just hope to live a life that would inspire others to, to follow Christ and to trust him. Dan, we have a question from, or a statement from somebody here. I don't know if, if he wants to be known or not. It says it's to everyone. But I'm not going to uh, reveal his name. I don't know whether you can see the chat list or not. I'm, I'm that new to Zoom. But he says, trying to live in faith makes me feel like such a failure because I'm always failing. What do you say to that, brother? 
Well, what I would do is I would start out by looking at being really open to God and saying, you know, if I'm going to do something, Lord, I want to remove my feelings and my biases about this. Father, do you want me in this? I want to show me through your word, lead me through your Holy Spirit, through providential circumstances that this is of you and that what you want me to do. And once that's established in your heart, I then would, um, I would lay it out before the Lord and I would trust him if it was starting a business or if it, whatever that ministry, whatever, excuse me, whatever it is, I would um, have a clear vision. I'd write down that clear vision of what it is that we're trying to do here. And I would say, Lord, keep me on track with that vision. And, and I would bring all of my needs before the Lord. And, and, you know, this, I forget how the scripture says, but it says by the, by the, um, the ear first and then the corn, it talks about the corn, you develop it step by step. So don't, don't start out by something huge. Start out by the little things, trusting God with the little things and just committing them to him. And um, you're going to find out things about yourself, but that's how I would, uh, I would start. Uh, Romans four says, uh, happy are those whose wrongs are forgiven, whose sins are pardoned. Happy mm -hmm. is the person whose sins the Lord will not keep account of. Mm -hmm. Amen. He is not watching for your failures. No. You, no. The, the song says, the only view God had to make is through the blood of Jesus. Yeah. When God sees you, he sees you through his son, if you're, if you're a follower of Christ. And so he doesn't see a failure for his son because, because he has taken all of your sin and put it on his son's shoulders at the cross and all of his son's righteousness and put it in you, reckoned it to your account. Yeah. So God, so God is not waiting to pounce on you and, and he's not counting your sins. What he is looking at these days, Graham Cook points out so well in his books, uh, is that he's working on the part of you that isn't like Christ yet. Yeah. Because, because when you step over the transom, as Pat O'Day did last night, into eternity, yeah. you're going to have a glorified body, no illness, no sin, no sorrow, and God and the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Holy Spirit mm. are working on us today to get us ready for that moment. Is that George, we, we talked about that earlier this week, George, when I was out for a walk, remember? Yeah. And, and, and we had that conversation and that blessed me so much that when I was walking to meditate on the fact that all my sin is forgiven, not only the sins of the past, but if I err in transgression today and I look to the Lord, it's forgiven. And, and I don't have to worry about, I just need to keep my heart on following him. And I think for that brother that asked that question about failing so many times, yeah, there's times I fail. There's times that I'm disappointed with what I said or did or something like that. And, and yet, the Father just loves me so much. And he, he just, I just feel him saying, go on, kid, go on. And, you know, George, I was so blessed by that, that when I was walking, meditating, I felt goosebumps. I felt like I could rip my clothes off and dance before the Lord. I was so happy because that scripture says, happy is he, right? I was so happy, but fortunately, sense prevailed and I was just joyously walking and worshiping the Lord. But um, that's the life he's given us. He's given us a life of joy. He's given us a life. If, and it's, I believe it's all about submission to him and following him, just trusting him. You know, I, I, we, have a, we have a pastor with us today, my friend Jedediah Johnson. And Jedediah may, may want to correct me here hermeneutically or exegetically. But, uh, you know, we die once and after that the judgment. And Christ mm -hmm. died on the cross to cover all our sins. Therefore, why do we tell people who are already <clears throat> ask God to forgive you your sins? They're already forgiven. We just read yeah. that in Romans four. Why? Why do we want to 
live with a conscious awareness of, of am I sinning all the time? It doesn't mean that we shouldn't yeah. live righteous lives, uh, but we, we, we uh, give away our, I'm going to say <clears throat> ignorance of what happened at the cross. What happened at the cross? He dealt mm -hmm. with sin once and for all. Hebrews mm -hmm. tells us we're not going, he's not going to put him on the cross again. So when you come to Christ as a believer, I think you say, God, that was, I really screwed up there. I'm sorry for that. I don't want yeah. to do that again. Thank you that you've already forgiven me. Amen. Amen. And you know, um, I had a revelation in a hotel room in 2004 in Bogota, Colombia. I'll never forget it. How do we walk in victory? How do we walk in a life that's pleasing to the Lord? And the Lord showed me in a simple scripture, be filled with the spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Yeah. So rather on us focusing what we're not supposed to do, we need to focus on being filled with the spirit and the presence of God. If we're filled with the spirit and the presence of God, then, then we won't do those things that disappoint our savior. And I, um, you know, it's just, it's like a marriage. My wife, I want, I want to please her. I want to bless her. I want to do things that, that because I love her. So it's, uh, it's good. Dan, we have a question here. How do you rest? How do you recharge? Yes. Um, so one thing I think is really important. I, I have made for the last 30 years of my life, I'm 63, uh, 40 years. I've been inter interested in human performance from an athletic point of view. I've been a kickboxer, been in the, um, hockey, played over 15, 20 international hockey matches and uh, was a powerlifting champion way back in the day. And uh, just been, had an interest in how do we maximize our performance? And that went over into the executive world. And I lived early in my youth was um, – sleep. I actually tried to train myself uh, to sleep on four hours a night because then that gave me a whole new four hours to work in my business and doing it. That was disastrous. That lasted for about two years and then I ended up in the hospital and they thought I had a stroke and all kinds of problems. And I, Jesus was very adamant about rest. That rest is important. And so I focus on good sleep, good uh, preparatory habits before going to sleep. I do some crazy things. I have a, a mat that I lay on. It's like a thousand bed of nails, but it's, it's like these little pin things that uh, um, uh, increase the blood flow in your body and that. And I, uh, I'll often have a really hot shower or bath before. We really focus on a really good night's sleep. And then I, I don't, I used to set my alarm clock to 4, 4.30 in the morning. I don't do that anymore. I just wake up when my body, when my body's restored. And sometimes, you know what, sometimes I wake up at 3 a.m. And sometimes I wake up at 8 a.m., you know, if I push the limit too much. But number one is sleep. Number two, for me, um, hockey has been a wonderful, restful thing that just allows me to offset the pressures of life. You know, I get out on a hockey rink for an hour and a half. You don't, you don't have time to think about your problems when some big guys barreling down on you to lay a check on you. And um, also uh, golf. Lately, I've uh, found that golf is a wonderful four and a half hours of just walking and talking with the Lord. And, uh, and I'm getting a little better. I got golfer's elbow right now. So I'm on, on the sidelines at the moment, but those two things. And then the other third thing that I love to do is um, I sit on my deck and I really enjoy reading because I love to learn. So uh have a copy and sit on my deck. On your uh, website, Dan, uh, you have listed the books that you've been reading. And the guys yeah. can go to lonelyfinancial.com if they want to see a, a great bibliography. Uh, tell us about Guatemala. What's going on down there? And how did you get involved? 2005, I got asked to go to Guatemala for a client um, to consult for him in a meeting. And I didn't want to go. I told him four. I told him no four times. And I said, they shoot people down there. I'm not going there. Uh -huh. And and I have this crazy bucket list, George, as you know. And I saw 
a soccer game in Europe with the riot police and the flares and the smoke and everything and the barbed wire fences. And I asked this gentleman, this client, I said, well, do they have those soccer games with the barbed wire fence and uh, uh, the riot police and all that? Sort of like going to run with the bulls, right? He said, oh, yeah. I said, okay, tell you what, you get me in the soccer game, I'll go to your meeting, two-hour meeting in Guatemala. So night before I left, I was sort of lamenting my decision, went to my wife, who I call my barefoot prophet, in the kitchen and said, honey, it makes no sense why I'm going to Guatemala for a two-hour me meeting to shoot people down there. She says, yeah, I know, honey. Um, I know, but when you go there, God will reveal to you why you're there. And I want to show you something. So she took me in the living room. She showed me a, a suitcase that she filled with $300 full of dolls, toys, coloring books, crayons, that kind of thing. She says, I want you to take this to an orphanage. There's lots of orphanages in Guatemala. So I flew to Guatemala. My client got his contract. That was good. Uh, I said, I need help to go to an orphanage somewhere to deliver the suitcase. They arranged for a lady to pick me up, took me to a house where a woman for four years had been taking, she, a retired American teacher had been taking um, little girls off the street, tattered dresses, barefoot, um, begging for food. And when I met her, she had 22 of these little girls in the house. So heard the story, wonderful, got to the house, met Mama Carol, said, I hardly even know what's in here, but God bless you, what you're doing, it's great. And I, I had my agenda, was to go back to my five-star hotel, uh, have a workout, had a beautiful gym, spa, have a back rub, swim, to go for a steak dinner. And she says to me, no, you can't leave, you gotta come meet the girls. And I went, my heart fell, but I didn't wanna be rude, so went in. Then she says, I want you to give out all the toys. Do you know what she was doing? Well, I handed out these um, toys and the, the girls just screamed. And, uh, and it really touched me because I just adopted, my wife and I just adopted two little girls of Honduran set. So I had two little cuties like that, I call them my cinnamon girls. And um, then that was great, but not life-changing. But what happened next changed my life. She took me through the house. Now, this is 2005. This is before human trafficking was in the news and all the rest of it, before my friend uh, Brian McConaughey at uh, Ratnak uh, Foundation in Cambodia and all the work that they do with sex trafficking and all that. This is 2005, and, and Mama Carol took me through the house, introduced me to the girls one by one, told me their stories. Well, as a man in my 50s, early 50s, I had never even once thought about a six-year-old girl in prostitution. Wasn't aware of it, never even crossed my, never heard of it. I, and I'm a hockey player. I wanted to grab a hockey stick and just go after these guys. And I actually said to her, I said, Mama, I had to bite my lip. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. You know, it's one thing to hear these stories when we know those little precious faces in front of you, those little, those little gems in front of you to hear what they went through. I said to her, why, why don't just a group of men get baseball bats and go after these guys? It's a very unchristian mm -hmm. thing to say. Mm -hmm. But I guess the hockey player came out at me in that moment. And um, with sorrowful eyes, she looked at me and she said, Dan, you don't get it. These girls were put in prostitution, most of them by their mothers, because it's a cycle that has gone on. Well, the only, the only motherhood I know is my mother, my wife, my mother-in-law. Wonderful examples of what a mom is all about. I went back to the, my hotel room that night. And I just wept. I wept. I phoned my wife. I was a mess. And you know what? I'm supposed to be a tough guy. You know, hockey player, ex-kickboxer, broken noses, broken cheekbones, all of that. Been through all of that. And I wept. And I, uh, and I was heartbroken. And I, that night, I got down on my knees beside my bed. And I said, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to be true to you. But I want to go. I want to. I want to go and kill somebody right now. I'm so angry at what has happened to these little girls. I want to go and kill somebody. I want to go after these guys and stop this. And the Lord spoke to my heart that night, and it was this. He said, Dan, I have rescued those little girls, and I have saved those little girls, and I'm healing those little girls, but I want you to know something. I hung on a cross, not only for them, but for the perpetrators that have violated them. Broke my heart. That the worst of sinners 
Jesus died for hung on the cross for them, for me. And uh, I had amazing peace come into my life that night. Went home, got home, and uh, the story goes back 30 years now, 35 years prior to that, where my father, one Saturday morning, came in, sat on the edge of my bed, started talking to me. And he said, son, I'm going to sell my company. I'm 13 years old at that point. And I said, oh, okay. I'm wake, kind of waking up. And I said, dad, what are you going to do? And he said, I don't know, but I'm going to do something with you, son. And I said, okay. Um, what are you going to call it? He said, well, I'm going to call it, we'll call it J.R. Loney and son. My dad's name was James Ralph Loney. And then he said something to me I never forgot. He said, and son, you know what we're going to do? We're going to build an orphanage for kids. We're going to help a bunch of kids. And I said, oh, okay, dad. And then he got up and he walked out of my room. I never forgot that. A year later, his corporate airplane crashed into a mountain. He and everybody on board were killed. And I sat on a cliff overlooking the water where we lived. Our house was on a high cliff, Tawasson. And uh, I thought, you know what? I'm going to keep my, my dad had a dream to help children. So I'm going to, I'm going to fulfill that dream. One day I'm going to build a house for kids. And uh, we're going to, uh, I figured what I do is work at a job all my life. And then I would sell my house, take the money, build this house for children. And then I would live in an apartment or something. At least I fulfilled my dream. Well, I didn't. And when I married Joy, she was 18 years old. I had to wait for her to turn 18 right out of high school. I was a very mature 22. And uh, I said, oh, by the way, on her wedding day, I said, honey, one thing we have to do is build an orphanage in memory of my father. She said, oh, that's fine, dear. So, I mean, what would an 18-year-old bride say? And... Uh, I flew back and I said to Joy, Joy, I think I know where we're supposed to build that orphanage now. So I flew back. And when I was flying back to Guatemala, <clears throat> I usually always sit in the aisle seat because I'm a bigger guy and I got a little more boring. But I remember I was in a window, window seat this flight and looking out at 39,000 feet and praying this prayer. I said, Father, I have no idea what I'm doing. I want to go help this lady. Her dream is to build an orphanage. And I know, 22 girls crammed into this house. Please help me. Give me some kind of sign. Got to Guatemala, took Mama Carol for lunch and said, Mama Carol, my wife and I have decided to come alongside you financially and prayerfully to support your dream of building an orphanage. And she wept. She ate the lunch table, just wept. And she said, Dan, I'm so thankful that you've decided to help me with the James Project. But when she said James Project, I nearly fell out of my chair because that was my dad's name. But she named it James Project from James 127, that true religion is taking care of widows and orphans in their distress and keeping oneself unspotted from the world. So that's today we have 15 acres, so 4,000 meals a month. We have 100 children, you know, take or give a little bit, 100 children. And uh, then we have a project um, in a, a town about two hours away, a youth center that um, my friend built, we, we helped with that. And, uh, and we have about 70, 80 kids that come for food every day, a little bit of schooling and hear the gospel. So that's, that's Guatemala. Dan, we have about two and a half minutes. Uh, tell us about what's going on in Peru. I have no idea what you've got going there. In Peru? Um, Peru project? No, nothing in Peru. Well, I must have been hearing things. Okay, I asked you uh, earlier this week, what are three the three major sandboxes that you're playing in at this time? And you told me the word of God, prayer, and allowing God to be your CEO. Give us, uh, give us a couple minutes on that. So I've committed to, to um, a life of prayer. And my, I look at all my goals as minimum, medium, and what I call my max goal or mega goal. And I just felt, you know, I've heard people say, well, you, you don't say I'm going to spend 60 minutes with your wife. It's more, you know, uh, uh, um, spontaneous. But, but no, Jesus said to Peter and the disciples, could you guys spend an hour? So I committed to spend that a minimum, that hour every day with the Lord. And I've, there's many examples of prayer in the Bible. And I've made a 20-year study of prayer. 
And I'm just trying to model my life after the life of Daniel. Daniel was an immensely successful individual. So if I can get three times of prayer in today, that would be the perfect day. I don't always, but I'm just fine. As you know, George, I, in the morning, like this morning, I went on a prayer walk. And uh, that prayer walk was at, uh, a little bit behind schedule. So I went from seven to eight. But I took my seven-year-old son with me. And as we walked, I taught him to pray. I taught him to pray for mom. I taught him to pray for his brother, that we would have that conversational prayer with the father and, and just developing those relationships. So number one is prayer. And, and that's, you know, where I believe where it all starts. Dan, uh, you've got so many more things that, that I wanted you to share with us, but we, we don't have time. Tell us when you, you have a, you have a leadership Academy coming up this fall. Is that right? Yeah, we have a uh, leadership Academy and we were going to go with September, but because of the COVID as a moving target, we just don't know that people would be able to attend with our provincial laws and, and uh, social distancing, but we're looking at November right now. So uh, we will put that on our website, uh, loneyleadership.com. We'll announce when, um, that is, and then we, I'll be in uh, October, I'll be in um, Scottsdale with Bob teaching the um, Consulting Institute there. 